why does it feel like we are living in a freaking episode of Black Mirror? This is crazy. Check out this video from the World Economic Forum. It is absolutely insane. You can freak me out. Today, I'll be exploring the dark workings of the World Economic Forum, free speech, and mindfulness gurus. But before that, be sure to subscribe, hit like, and check out Sublation Press's catalog, including Norman Finkelstein's I'll Burn That Bridge When I Get To It, on cancel culture and the culture war out now. I've recently discovered TikTok and it's a wasteland, but this video caught my attention. Check out this video from the World Economic Forum. It is absolutely insane Even you can't and freaks me out. you've been. Your memo is finished, your inbox is under control, and you're feeling sharper than you have in a decade. Sensing your joy, your playlist shifts to your favorite song, sending chills up your spine as the music begins to play. You glance at the program running in the background on your computer screen and notice a now familiar sight that this appears real whenever video. you're overloaded with pleasure. Your state of brainwave activity decreasing in the temporal regions of your brain. It's true, this is a real video, but it's not somebody's power hungry plan for world domination. It's an intentionally dystopian scenario produced by Nita Farahani, a Duke University legal ethicist, and presented at the World Economic Forum in January 2023 in Davos, Switzerland. It's supposed to be a warning about what new brain surveillance technologies can become if we don't harness them for good. But that's exactly why I find this presentation so interesting. The World Economic Forum is not some cabal of puppet masters pulling the strings of society. Our society is doing this all on its own. And that's kind of Farahani's point. You may be surprised to learn that it's a future that has already arrived. But the real dystopia is not the animation, and it's not some evil future where Klaus Schwab takes control. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh... It's precisely in harnessing them for good. That's the dystopia. And I know what you're thinking. World Economic Forum, this is low-hanging fruit. But it's interesting not because it stands out, but because it's nothing special. You can hear all about the exciting, brave new world of AI surveillance for rooting out thought I mean, hate crime from uh, governments all over the world, you know, Scotland, Canada. There's nothing special about what's happening at the World Economic Forum. Davos is simply a meeting of worldwide technocrats seeking to rub shoulders and get a jump on new technologies and technological changes that they think are inevitable. And even if we're careful, Good, actually. Your mind starts to wander to the new colleague on your team, whom you know you shouldn't be daydreaming about, given the policy against intra-office romance. But you can't help fantasizing just a little. But then you start to worry that your boss will notice your amorous feelings when she checks your brain activity and shift your attention back to the present. When you arrive at work the next day, a somber cloud has fallen over the office. Along with emails, text messages, and GPS location data, the government has subpoenaed employees' brainwave data from the past year. They have compelling evidence that one of your coworkers has committed massive wire fraud. Now, they're looking for his co-conspirators. You discover they are looking for synchronized brain activity between your coworker and the people he has been working with. While you know you're innocent of any crime, You've been secretly working with him on a new startup venture. Shaking, you remove your earbuds. Why start with a dystopian scenario? Why start with a nightmarish image of the future? Well, there are lots of dystopias, and they do lots of things. But there are two things that we can draw out here to help us understand what's going on. The first thing is that they warn us about what our society can become. But also, by giving us nightmare scenarios of the future, they subtly send the message that today is better than tomorrow. By beginning with this chilling animation, Farahani warns us about what our society can become, but she also subtly sends the message that the present state of affairs is desirable. At the same time, she also puts us in the position of the courageous resistor, like Winston in 1984 or Jonas in The Giver. We can be the force for good that stands up to totalitarianism. Because I think done well, neurotechnology has extraordinary promise. Done poorly, it could become the most oppressive technology we've ever introduced in a wide scale across society. We still have the chance to make it right. But here's the thing that dystopias also do. 
they don't just warn us about the bad things that can happen in the future. It strikes me a bit like, I don't know if you've read The, the Giver by Lois Lowry. She imagines a time in the future where you have these families, um, and, but the families are created by the community. And so you have these experts who kind of, you know, you apply to have a family and they find you a suitable mate, you know, based on these metrics. They, you know, they, they very carefully match these traits and it's all kind of expert led. Uh, you know, how did she get to that dystopia, which I think might, you know, be useful in, in looking at how people go that way. She's written a bit about this. And what, one of the things that she's, she says in passing is that um, I was just trying to imagine things that I thought would be really good. In Lois Lowry's The Giver, made into a terrible movie in 2014, the author imagines a world in which all suffering and deep emotion have been banished. All of life is literally just shades of gray. Literally, they take pills and they only see shades of gray. And those who risk becoming a burden on the community are released. And this is the thing, Farahani seems to imagine that the real problem of dystopia, the real risk of things going wrong, is when a company uses these technologies without your best interests at heart. Like if they're using it for monitoring and they're not thinking about employee well-being. When employees are contemplating office romances or looking out windows and becoming a threat to productivity. And actually, it's a bit unclear whether or not she even thinks these things are a problem, even though she presents them in a somewhat chilling way in the animation. All right, well, does the same analysis hold true if instead of trying to monitor whether a person is falling asleep or awake, we decide that we want to monitor their attention levels to see whether or not they're paying attention and being productive? I would argue, maybe not. What if there's nowhere to go? What if everywhere has ubiquitous monitoring. In fact, during the pandemic, what we found was that 80% of companies admitted that they use at least some forms of so-called bossware technology to monitor the productivity of their employees. Surveillance is part of our everyday lives. Surveillance for productivity is part of what has become the norm in the workplace, and maybe with good reason. Nine out of 10 employees waste time during the workday. They focus on other things. There may be good reasons why we want to be able to find better ways to monitor whether somebody is paying attention or they're doing something different. But the real nightmare is not when people use these things for evil, but when they try to use them for good. There's another pathway forward with this technology, which I find to actually be quite exciting and something that I think companies should be experimenting with. And that is the use of the technology to make the workplace a more responsive workplace to the individual worker. One where humans and robots and AI work seamlessly together in order to optimize a better and healthier workplace. This idea of cognitive ergonomics is what I think is the future of the healthier workplace, a place that adapts to our abilities, slows down when we need to slow down, and helps us to reset so that we don't suffer from endless cycles of stress. These are innovations that can make our lives better. The real nightmare is the world that carries on unable to see that it's done anything wrong when it thinks it's doing good, where people continue pushing forward because they're doing the right thing. The worst tyranny isn't exercised for nefarious purposes, but out of love, out of kindness, because you don't realize you should fight back and your tyrant doesn't realize they're a tyrant. I'll come back to this in a minute, but for now, what we need to realize is that what people like Farahani are doing is simply tracing present trends into the future. This is also what dystopian fiction does and the results are predictably dystopian. But because they see no alternative. No alternative, no alternative. There is no alternative. There is no alternative. To the present state of affairs, it's in their interest to portray the present state of affairs as just fine and, and good actually. Because for them, technological advancement has become this like inhuman force that far outpaces our primitive human capacities. In fact, a, a World Economic Forum press release put out in 2016 put it this way. We are confronting the challenges of the 21st century with a primordial piece of kid that evolved over millennia to keep us safe from predators, and that we struggle to understand. It's as if the challenges of the 21st century just arose out of the soil and confronted these dithering apes who had nothing to do with it. And I use the World Economic Forum quote because that's who I'm focusing on, but the idea that the modern world is just too complex for our primitive brains to understand is a very common trope of policymakers and their knowledge class lackeys. Our brains aren't accustomed to taking in this much information this fast. 
So they follow all these bad trends and they say, don't worry, this lesser evil will save you. And anyway, this is where the future over which we have no control is simply taking us. You have two choices. Use the tech or have it used against you. What do you think? Is it a future you're ready for? Yeah. You may be surprised to learn that it's a future that has already arrived. What's missing in Farahani's dystopian nightmare is any discussion of why all this technology developed in the first place. Now, obviously there's lots going on, but there's one important thing that we can consider and that's competition. Competition between companies demands that every step be counted, every motion optimized, and well, every heartbeat counted, every brainwave surrendered. And all of this in the quest to pump a little bit of lifeblood into increasingly anemic profits. And if you don't do it, another company will and they'll win out. But workers have a pesky tendency to reject all of this monitoring. But it turns out that that kind of technology in the workplace, particularly when it's used to monitor productivity of employees, where they're moving throughout the factory floor, whether or not they're taking breaks or unscheduled breaks, is the kind of thing that employees resist, unionize against, rise up against, and undermines morale. We imagine that power is exercised by beating people into submission, but that's too incomplete. It leaves your mind free. The most effective form of power comes from within the subject. You control yourself. The boss doesn't need to watch you. You watch yourself. I believe that there is a pathway forward with such technology, but it's putting it in the hands of employees, enabling them to use it for themselves as a choice, whether or not they want to focus, whether or not they want the technology in order to improve their own performance, but we can make a choice. We can make a choice to use it well. We can make a choice to have it be something that empowers individuals, that helps them gain insights into their own mental health and well-being, improves their own productivity and wellness, and sets them on a pathway where, like quantifying your heart rate or other kinds of health, it can be something that unlocks potential for humanity. Power is exercised through the appearance of freedom. You have the appearance of choice, but really there's only one available, or actually two. Choose this technology or have it forced upon you. We also have to be mindful of the changing landscape of biometric laws as this information becomes part of the workplace environment and decide to move forward in a way that is best for humanity, using the technologies and ways that enable us on a pathway forward, rather, than oppress us. I think that's a possibility we can still choose. I hope it's one that you'll join me in choosing. Again, there's nothing special about what Farahani is doing here. She's just a very good example of someone speaking in the well-known language of the neoliberal technocrat. She is a great example of the trends described by social theorists like Michel Foucault. But now it seems like we read Foucault like a rule book, all the better to exercise, to be the ones to exercise the power that he describes. In more than 5,000 companies across the world, employees are already having their brainwave activity monitored to test for their fatigue levels. Whether it's the Beijing-Shanghai line, where train conductors are required to wear hats that have sensors that pick up their brain activity, or mining companies throughout the world, employees are already having their brain activity monitored, and it may wear, it very well may be something that we want to embrace as a society. Okay. You might be shuddering. That feeling of unease you have, you should get over it because we can ensure this becomes a force for good. But as I was saying before, that's where the real potential for evil comes in. Like with Google, the switch from don't be evil to do the right thing signified a truly diabolical turn. Or as C.S. Lewis famously said, Of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. Those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. Focusing in the world of wearable technology as opposed to implanted technology, and I do believe that within many of our lifetimes we'll see healthy people using implanted brain technology as well. Then we can decode complex thought. Again, that's frightening but promising, because think about most of neurological disease and suffering are those disruptions of brain activity which we'll start to be able to pick up. So there's this little flip that she does in this video. 
she gives this dystopian scenario and then she flips it where it's like, actually, I know this is scary, but it can be good. It really could become the most oppressive technology that we've ever unleashed. I don't want that because I also think it can be the most empowering technology that we've ever realized if we do it right. Again, this dystopian scenario functions to tell us this bad future is a possibility, but we actually have this now. How many of you wear something like an Apple Watch? Fitbit, smart device? Yeah, many people. It's a many billion dollar company. I mean, many billion dollar industry at this point. Wearable devices, quantifiable self is just a widespread movement. Most people are very comfortable with at least some forms of human quantification. It's here. And the present scenario is actually better. And it's fine. And it can continue to be fine as long as you choose it. Now, a lot of responses to this video talk about it being Orwellian and, and 1984 has arrived. But actually, the more obvious dystopian analogy here is The Circle by Dave Eggers, also made into a terrible movie in 2017. It tells the story of a fictional company called The Circle, obviously based on Google, in which privacy has become a thing of the past. The film culminates in more and more people going clear, which is this kindly and, and voluntary act of full transparency, where everybody allows themselves to be filmed and all, all of their private information is just totally public. And of course, the book ends as The Last Horizon, decoding brainwaves is about to be crossed. More importantly, Eggers captures this, all this bad stuff is good actually flip really well. Imagine the human rights implications. Protesters on the streets of Egypt no longer have to hold up a camera, hoping to catch human rights violations. Now it's as easy as gluing a camera to a wall. Actually, we've done just that. The interesting thing about this as a dystopia is that it's not some terrible future that we can avoid. It's the here and now. There's no return to a harmonious present where we will still have time to make these bad trends good. The good trends, the things that are being framed as good and progressive, are precisely what's bad. The essence is that the sensors would be installed in every room and would be programmed to know what was within normal boundaries and what was anomalous. Something anomalous happens, the alarm goes off, and ideally the alarm alone stops or slows whatever's happening in the room. Meanwhile, the authorities have been notified. Finnegan and her program were immensely popular. The dominant messages were coming from victims of various crimes, women and children who had been abused in their homes, saying the obvious. If only this had been around 10 years ago, 15 years ago. At least, they all said in one way or another, this kind of thing will never happen again. The future is now, and it's not good. Eggers even uses the infamous trope of having microchips implanted as this crusade against child abduction led by a character whose sister was abducted as a child. And that's where they get you. In the face of well-being and fighting crime and protecting the vulnerable, what monster would demand freedom? Suddenly dystopias no longer seem so dystopian. They sound good actually. What you're seeing here is my brain activity while I'm wearing a simple device like the one on the right. We're not talking about implanted devices of the future. I'm talking about wearable devices that are like Fitbits for your brain. Here's where the focus on the World Economic Forum can lead us astray. Almost this exact line was something I saw over and over again in major newspapers when I was doing my study on mindfulness in corporations and in personal life and in business and just, just everywhere, policy everywhere. For example, back in 2014, Google's head of mindfulness described mindfulness apps as a Fitbit for your mind and looked forward to devices that would be able to show how meditation impacts brainwaves. He foresaw the potential for creating a whole industry of professional trainers. Just imagine, he says, setting a goal like a year from now, I want to be able to calm my mind in 40% of the time it takes me now. And my personal trainer is accountable to that target. And this, of course, was long before Neuralink's creepy use of that phrase. And anyway, you already wear a Fitbit. Why not just add a few more features? And it's not just here where the language of the mindfulness guru comes in. The way I define it is it's paying attention on purpose in the present moment. Becoming more aware of our... Uh, thoughts and the types of thoughts that we have can actually really support us to reconnect to the present moment so that we're actually more in touch with what's actually happening rather than just being in our thoughts or imaginations and fantasies about our experience. Your mind starts to wander to the new colleague on your team whom you know you shouldn't be daydreaming about given the policy against intra-office romance. 
but you can't help fantasizing just a little. But then you start to worry that your boss will notice your amorous feelings when she checks your brain activity and shift your attention back to the present. But it's not just here. Mindfulness vloggers love to claim that people go through life on autopilot. In a way, when we're on autopilot, we're sleepwalking through our lives. How much of your day is spent on autopilot? Doing things without actually being aware that you're doing things. Autopilot. 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 Being lost in thought is like being on automatic pilot mode. With these bad boys on, your automatic thoughts function like commands and direct orders. As I wrote in Compact a while back, without the special practices provided by the mindfulness guru, the practices advocates would have us believe. We are ruled by uncontrollable emotions. Our internal world is described as constantly hijacked by fears or worries by the technologies we use, leading us to poor decision making. Fortunately, learning mindfulness can jolt people out of their supposed stupor. If we could just get the mindless masses to wake up, the thinking goes, all would be well. We might soon even use the technology to help people wake back up. This is a haptic scarf that MIT Media Lab has developed, which uses brainwave technology in a responsive way to give a person a little buzz, literally, when their mind starts to wander to help them refocus and hone their attention. Say what you want about Buddhism, whatever, but capitalism is wearing it as a skin suit. Why do I mention this? Because it shows us another aspect that underpins this technology that you might not notice at first. There may be problems in the world, but the problem is you. Don't we all have problems maintaining our attention? Think of the lost productivity. Surely this awaits a technological solution. What we've seen consistently is companies from Amazon to Tesco to Walmart and others have introduced what is considered to be bossware or surveillance technology that employees really don't like it even if it makes their lives better. According to who? These people always have some metric that they swear knows you better than you know yourself. So it turns out that one of the most compelling early applications of this technology is to be able to decode at least some simple affective states of individuals that can potentially improve their well-being, potentially improve productivity, but certainly transform what our lives look like in the workplace and in our everyday activities. Consider the fact that right now, many workplaces have individuals who have to be awake and alert at all times in order to do their jobs well. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Take this example where this trucker decided to take a 20 hour shot for a 1500 mile ride, well exceeding the amount of time that any trucker, long haul trucker is supposed to drive. His employer didn't discover his choices until the fatal accident that was disastrous for the company and cost many lives. But he could have known much sooner. He could have detected whether or not the trucker was entering into the earliest stages of microsleep, starting to go from being alert to tired well before it occurred. And he could have done so through a simple hat, a simple wearable hat that has embedded electrode sensors that would pick up brainwave activity to help the employer and the employee know what stage of alertness the person was experiencing and whether or not they were starting to fall asleep. See, this is all very good. It's for safety, it's for mental health. Think of the lives saved. See, this is how power operates. It's the iron fist in a velvet glove. And all this is no one's plan. A lot of roads lead to this dystopian endpoint, the ever rising need to squeeze every last productive minute out of a worker leads here. But so too does an explanatory model that sees human weakness at the heart of almost every social problem. In fact, in that press release that I mentioned before, they also state another common trope of our governing class, and that is that the roots of inequality lie in childhood. It sounds so caring, but what they're saying is what every good eugenicist always said. For the roots of inequality, look no further than the person in front of you. I found a flaw, I don't know how significant or permanent it is, but I've been very distressed by that fact. The market is not functioning properly. There's a problem, they say, but it can't be us. It can't be all this. It must be you. So now we have to put an electronic hat, surveillance, put it on three and a half million people because of a small number of accidents. Yeah, very good. No, we're not going to change anything systematic 
about the about the industry. We're not going to stop the exploitation of drivers. No, we're just going to make you wear this hat. <laughs> now, I should say that Farhani does make an attempt to bring freedom into the discussion. I believe we have to start by recognizing a right to cognitive liberty. This is a right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences. It requires that we update existing international human rights, like freedom of thought, mental privacy, and self-determination over our own mental experiences. But this is the problem. As I said, in the face of safety and health and life itself, what monster would demand freedom? The progressive position became the caring position, the kind position. Protect the weak, the victim, the vulnerable, be kind. In service of decency, love, and kindness, exceptions must be made. What progressive person now thinks that you should be free to think racist thoughts or, or transphobic thoughts? And again, it's, it's the present, not the dystopian future that gives us the best example of this. Governments around the world are falling all over themselves to censor on the basis of controlling misinformation, protecting the vulnerable, and new technologies are just another way to help with that. Look, having freedom doesn't mean you always do the right thing. It means you are free also to do the wrong thing sometimes, to say the wrong thing sometimes. Otherwise, freedom is empty. No one ever felt the need to demand freedom to say things that nobody was bothered by. Freedom of speech was about freedom to be offensive. That's the whole damn point. In fact, audience members were most optimistic about the health, safety, and well-being uses of the technology. They worried about bad actors getting their hands on it. But as I keep saying, it's precisely in trying to use the technology for good where the potential for evil comes in. But that's not enough. We have to do more, and corporations have to adopt best practices for the implementation of this technology. Focusing on positive uses for employees to improve their work workplace productivity, increase safety, and decrease the burdens on individuals. It really strikes me how much technology seems to have a life of its own and how humans just passively react to it. It's an exciting future, a seamless future. It's a future that has already arrived. Humans don't make this world. We're just here with our primitive brains trying to make sense of it as it goes by. Our agency is limited to maybe regulation and making the best of what we're given. But there's another option, and that's to understand why this technology develops in the first place, why it's almost inevitably going to be used against us to make us stronger and faster and less distracted and more aware, whether we like it or not. Because all people like Farahani are doing, like any dystopian fiction writer, is following events of the present to their logical conclusions. Same with that other viral article where you'll own nothing and be happy. Lots of dystopias warn us about what the future can become, but also by giving us nightmare scenarios of that future, they subtly send the message that the present is better than tomorrow. That the way the technologies are now, that the potentials they hold, are something that we should embrace. The imperative is to reject the dystopia and embrace the present. But the present is the dystopia. It's a present where, like the giver or the circle, we can't even understand why we need the bad as well as the good. So what's my point in all this? Are the evil villains of Davos trying to control your brain? No, the people gathered there are just learning about developments in technology that have come about for a variety of reasons. Dystopias point us to the logical outcomes, not only of bad trends, but of good trends. Things we might never accept are sold to us as the only good choice of the compassionate human being, of the good citizen. They're sold to us by people who've had enough of dystopias. Get over the shutter, because this will happen whether you choose it or not. And since in their minds there is no alternative, everything you see is just the wellspring of nature, your only choice is to pop some flowers in your chains and make them your own. So what do we do? We need to resist explanations where everything wrong in the world starts in your brain. Because when it starts there, it ends there too.